Gary Sturman is the host of Prophecy in the News, web and TV broadcast. He is the ministry's primary contributor today. Since uh, 1989, he has written articles and co-authored books. Let me get this up here for my blind eyes. Co-authored books in affiliation with the late J.R. Church, founder of Prophecy in the News. Gary is also editor of the ministry magazine. This important ministry originates television, audio, video, print productions, dedication uh, dedicated to the exposition of Bible prophecy to a global audience. Gary believes that the prophetic exegesis of God's Word Word, is one of the most effective ways of convicting the contemporary mind of the need for the redemption that is offered only through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Since 1983, Gary has also pastored Grace Fellowship Church in Oklahoma City, a community devoted to in-depth linguistic, historical, and contextual Bible study from the premillennial, pre-tribulational, and dispensational perspective. Gary recently authored the best-selling book, Time Travelers of the Bible, How Hebrew Prophets Shattered the Barriers of Time-Space. And uh, let me add to this that Gary is absolutely, no, all joking aside, one of my favorite, and has been for a very long time, for a long time, one of my favorite uh, writers on the subject of end time prophecy. And as a matter of fact, I would be happy to plagiarize his material and report it to be my own <laughs> if there wasn't already so many other people doing that for me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... Welcome, Gary Stearman of Prophecy in the News. <clears throat> ah, thank you, Tom. Wow, what can I say? Tonight, we're going to be talking about time and space and God and Bible prophecy. Four of my favorite subjects. And these are subjects that secular men and sacred men down through the ages have talked about and come to no particular conclusions. However, <clears throat> conclusions are possible. And before I begin, I'd like to open in prayer and let's just commit our time to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for this gathering tonight. We ask that uh, the words spoken here, the thoughts expressed from your word, will be fitting and proper and appropriate, and that we will be edified by them. And we pray this through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And let's talk about what a lot of people are saying. It's about time. You know, uh, people are very, very eager, I would say. They're saying, you know, it, it's about time for the Lord to come. And yet, prophecy is one of the most controversial subjects in the world today. The imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ is hotly debated and actually believed by only a small fraction of Christians worldwide, which I find amazing. We're going to be talking about the any moment return of Christ, and when you talk about any moment, you're talking about a moment in time. <clears throat> and Time uh, was the subject of this book that uh, Tom mentioned a minute ago. I started thinking about time, as many other people have thought about time, and I discovered that the Bible is literally the book of time. Today there are huge uh, doctrinal differences in eschatology. Uh, most would doubt that Jesus Christ is coming back at all, or if, if he's coming back maybe in some spiritual form. but. Certainly, he's not coming back as literally described in the Bible. That's just for sort of immature people who want to believe that. Uh, maybe he'll come in a time of war. Maybe he'll come in a time of peace. Maybe he'll come to set up the millennium. Maybe there's no millennium at all. You've heard all the arguments. Maybe there's no tribulation. Maybe there is a tribulation. <clears throat> maybe it's three and a half years long. Maybe it's seven years long. You've heard all the arguments. Take your choice. But... I'm not going to be talking about the points of argumentation this evening. I'm here to encourage you all. And I hope that when I'm finished, you'll, your heart will be lightened just a little bit by what God has done. You've heard this phrase, Jesus is coming soon. Have you not? I mean, 
preachers ever since 1970 and before have been uh, ending their messages by saying Jesus is coming soon. Now why did they say that? Well, everything's in place prophetically. The stage is set. But there are others who say, well, you can't say <clears throat> soon. Maybe not so far away, but certainly not soon. And then somebody else will say soon. Well, when? Well, I think next year. Okay, great. And, and we've all been here, right, for the last 40 years. <laughs> it, this year for sure. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And, and that can get kind of frustrating. So that's why I want to talk about time today. I really want to talk about time because everybody talks about time. <clears throat> There's an old saying that, that is humorous, and, and it is that t uh, time was created by God to keep everything from happening at once, and it really kind of sounds funny, but you know what? It's the truth. He invented time out of nothing, I believe, he just brought time into being, and there's a reason why he did it. Will Rogers said half our life is spent trying to find something to do with the time we've rushed through life trying to save. Well, <laughs> yeah. And then that famous agnostic playwright, Eugene O'Neill, there is no present, there's no or future, only the past happening over and over again now. <laughs> and Solomon, sort of agreed with Eugene O'Neill. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. And Solomon was right. And yet Solomon was guessing. He didn't really know much. Nothing keeps, one philosopher said. There's one law in the universe, and that is the law of now. <clears throat> now. Hmm, what's now? The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, time is a created thing. To say, I don't have the time, is to say, I don't want to. Eh, interesting, we could talk about that for a long time if we had the time. A physicist by the name of Sean Carroll said, the asy asymmetry of time, the arrow that points from past to future plays an unmistakable role in our everyday lives. It accounts for why we cannot turn an omelet into an egg, why ice cubes never spontaneously unmelt in a glass of water, why we remember the past but not the future, and the origin of, it, of the asymmetry we experience can be traced all the way back to the orderliness of the universe near the Big Bang. Well, I don't even believe in the Big Bang. I, I believe in the Big God who said in the beginning <laughs> all sorts of wonderful things like let there be light. But that's another story. <clears throat> Every time you break an egg, says Sean Carroll, you are doing observational cosmology. And, and you know he has a point. It really is puzzling. You can break an egg and it drops into a bowl, but you cannot bring it up back up into the shell. That's the world in which we live. Little Yoda <coughs> had something to say about time in Star Wars. Now, Little Yoda is a, uh, an esoteric initiate and not to be trusted. That's, I think he's a little demon. But, <laughs> but what he said, what he said was, always in motion is the future. Well, what, what did he mean by that? He meant us Jedi really don't know the future because it's always moving, and so we can't pin it down, and we don't know anything about the future. Time is an illusion. Time is very much an illusion. It's, it's referred to as the arrow of time. And the arrow of time always points toward disorder. Disorder is called in the world of physics entropy. Everything's running down. Energy states are decreasing. And that's what Sean uh, Carroll was talking about. Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? You know, perspective. Satan has been impaled on the arrow of time 
which is running toward disorder. He knows that his time is short. He knows that his days are numbered, and he's doing everything he can to preserve time while there is still time, and which leads us to ask, what is time? Well, time is an illusion. Plato argued that time is a constant. He said it always runs at the same speed, but life is an illusion. Ooh, you've got to be a philosopher to say things like that. Galileo, the famous scientist, <clears throat> struggled with time, and then he drew a graph and put that in an envelope and sealed it away and never discussed the subject again in his life. Albert Einstein said that time is just one dimension. Uh, he's, he says that it's a fourth dimension to go along with up, down, side, side, forward, back. Uh, that we move through every day. So he thought it was, it was a, a dimension. And, you know, he said, time's based on our relationship to the environment. Weirdly, he said, the faster we travel, the slower time moves. And, and the most radical interpretation of this theory is that past, present, and future are merely figments of our imagination. And, and if you stop and think about it, if you're waiting on a bus and you're late, or a taxi, or something, what happens to time? It changes. It really, really does. Time changes its velocity depending on your own expectation. Maybe you've scheduled a trip to the dentist and you, you just are dreading this like mad. Have you noticed that time contracts? <laughs> and the next thing you know, you're in the dentist's chair. Whoa, where did all that time go? And this is what the philosophers are talking about. And, the, and, and, and they see time as the eternal now, the eternal present. Uh, it is an illusion. Time uh, is, consists of little moments back to back to back to back. The past is gone. If it hadn't been written about or filmed, You'd never even know it was there. It's dead, it's gone. If it hadn't been written in a book, the past is dead, it is gone. You could never recollect it. The future doesn't exist. It never happened. Only the present exists, and it exists in tiny little slices. A physicist friend of mine <clears throat> said that the smallest slice of time that you could cut, if you had a very, very, very sharp knife, is a slice 10 to the minus 43 inches. That's the number one preceded by 43 zeros, which is a fairly thin slice. If you sliced it any thinner than that, it would cease to exist and there would be no time at all, he said. Hmm. Well, that caused me to think. Time. A series of moments, a series of moments that just come one after another, and it's an illusion. It just keeps going, and you think when you see all those arrows, you think it's moving in one direction. You would be wrong if you thought that, <clears throat> and I'll show you why. God says, remember? <clears throat> the former things of old. For I am God, there's none else. I'm God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Notice the little red tinted letters there. He, he declared the end from the beginning. Now, if I were going to invent time, I would invent it starting at the beginning and I would run toward the end. Not God. He starts at the end and moves back to the beginning. Wait a minute. <clears throat> How does he do that? As far as I can see, time's running forward. But no. He sees time from the far end to the near end. And that tells us something else, too. It tells us that time has a beginning and an end, which means it's a finite commodity. There's, there's not an infinite amount of time. There's just so much of it measured out. Well, why would that be the case? Everything else that God touches seems to be infinite. 
Well, when he invented time, <clears throat> he invented time for a purpose because he goes on to say, declaring the end from the beginning from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east. Of course, that speaks of God's judgment. The man that executeth my counsel from a far country speaks of God's judgment. Yea, I have spoken it, I'll also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. <clears throat> so time, from the biblical perspective, is purposeful. And here's a modest little graph of how I see time viewed through the lens of the Bible. Time is a line. And here we've got a line that begins about 4000 BC and ends mm, maybe 4000 AD and it starts in the Garden of Eden and uh, we go through the life of Enoch and Abr the Abrahamic Covenant, King David and then Christ is born. Uh, we have the Dark Ages, uh, then in around A.D. 2000 plus we have the Antichrist coming and, and then the binding of Satan at the end of the millennium and then a new heaven and a new earth. So we've got a few thousand years along a line here. And what's in the middle? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is the balance point of this line that God made when he said, I declare the end from the beginning. Jesus is the center and purpose of everything. <clears throat> and what is that purpose? Redemption. Redemption. And what is redemption? Redemption is taking something busted and fixing it. <clears throat> Go back to some Bible characters. When I uh, wrote Time Travelers of the Bible, Enoch, of course, was a time traveler for me. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And here's the interesting thing about Enoch. If you read in the book of Enoch, chapter 1, verse 1, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. So here's a very, very, very old book, which by the way is quoted in the Bible by Jude, which gives it some credibility. And what is Enoch talking about? Writing from the days before the flood, he's talking about the tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Now if you read the book of Enoch, he describes traveling into the future. <clears throat> And how did he do it? Well, an angel escorted him into what he called a flying house. And the book of Enoch is filled with uh, narrations about the flying house that took Enoch to different places to see different things in the future. Except he didn't really call it the future. He just called it God's creation. And the angel escorted him into these various places where he saw amazing things that, that appear to be in our future. They haven't even happened yet. And long, long ago, Enoch saw them and reported on them. He was translated in order to make that happen. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. All of us here are going to be translated. I can't wait for my translation. I gotta tell you, I'm ready to be translated. And, and that's called resurrection, by the way. <clears throat> he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Enoch was a time traveler. I could go on and on and on. He, he wrote about the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. I'm sure you've read that in the book of Jude. Uh, where, And I'll just read it out of the book of Enoch. Uh, where he says, And behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all, destroy all the ungodly, and to <coughs> convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness, which they have ungodly committed, and the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken of him. Folks, this should encourage you. 
because all of the things we see happening in the world today are being noted, accounted for, and the moment in time when everything is set right has already been executed. Enoch has seen it. He, I believe he actually traveled into the future and came back to write a manuscript. We don't know how that happened. You think about Moses. I think about Moses as a time traveler. Uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Bet Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher until this day. So Moses died. Uh, he was a young man at age 120. And yet, Jewish history says that he really didn't die the way an ordinary man dies. Josephus says, now as soon as they were come to the mountain called Abarim, the regions beyond in Moab, he dismissed the Senate, that is the group that was traveling with him. And as he was going to embrace Eliezer and Joshua, was still discoursing with them, a cloud stood over him on a sudden, and he disappeared in a certain valley. Hmm. We don't know where that is. Although he wrote in the holy books that he died. Now how could he have written in the holy books that he died? You don't write much after you die, usually. He wrote in the holy books that he died. Those would be the books of Moses, which was done out of fear lest they should venture to say that because of his extraordinary virtue, he, he went to God. So Moses was taken up in a cloud. Where have we heard about people being taken up in clouds? Lots of places. Oh, yeah. And by the way, you remember the story about how uh, Michael the Archangel contended over the body of Moses against Satan. And he didn't accuse Satan of anything. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. Why would they be arguing over the body of Satan, of, of Moses? A body is not worth anything. About 85 cents, you know? It's just dust and, and, and bone. And yet this, there was this argument over the body of Moses. It must be a special body of some sort. Remember Elijah taken aloft in a, fl a fiery chariot predicted by Malachi to appear before uh, the day of the Lord. And of course, that's at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, Elijah went in a fiery chariot. He's going to come back again before the day of the Lord. But he came back even before that to the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? That's where Peter, James, and John went up a high mountain uh, and there they saw uh, Elijah and Moses. The Lord was uh, transfigured before them. And they said, wow, we must be in the kingdom. We must be in the kingdom. And so there at the top of that mountain were Elijah, who had been taken up in a fiery chariot. Moses, who according to Jewish history was taken up in a cloud. God the Father was up there, Jesus was at the top of the mountain, and Peter and James and John. You know how many people that is? That's seven people. And this was a preview of the kingdom. Elijah, the prophet, came to the Mount of Transfiguration. In other words, I think he traveled. That fiery chariot took him to heaven. He never died. He was still alive when Peter, James, and John met him on the mountaintop. And again, he appears in Revelation as one of the two witnesses. He's a time traveler, which is no big problem at all. We think time travel is a problem. Our scientists are working on it. I happen to have read some monographs from Boeing Aircraft Company, and they are actually working on time travel and claim to have uh, achieved it on an extremely limited basis. They're also working on the uh, uh, diminution of gravity, which would be a, a great... Uh, uh, a great boon to aircraft because if you can make an air airplane lighter, you burn less fuel. So you have gravity, which nobody understands, and time, which nobody understands, except Enoch and Moses and Elijah. And they all understand it perfectly well because God made it the end from the beginning. Ezekiel, of course, 
uh, comes to mind. He was most famously met by the chariot of the cherubim. He was taken aloft, he was flown to Jerusalem where he was allowed to peer down into the temple and to view the desecration, the ungodly things that had been going on inside the temple before the Babylonian captivity. And he reports on what he saw. Uh, he literally says, you know, I was escorted by God in the chariot of the cherubim. Hmm. You know, when he says what he does about flying in the chariot of the cherubim, he says, the hand of God pressed down hard upon me, and I heard the roaring of the wings of the cherubs as we departed for Jerusalem. Boy, does that ever sound like G-force to me. He traveled. Not only did he travel to Jerusalem, by the way, he traveled according to Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 into the future where he saw the plan for the Millennial Temple. And he said, I was taken there and I looked down upon it as the frame of the city. And what that means in plain English is, I was looking at a plan view of Jerusalem from the air. And then after he saw all these things, he was taken back to his time back to Babylon, and he wrote about what he saw. He's given a future view of what's going to happen in Israel. And of course, Ezekiel 40 through 48 are the, the uh, place in the Bible that you read if you want to read about the future, future temple uh, in Israel. And we could go on. The Apostle John he was taken through a heavenly door. He heard a, a voice that sounded like a trumpet. And the voice said, come up hither. And he entered into the door. And what did he see when he went through the door? He saw things that are yet future to us right now. Things that haven't happened yet for us, John already saw. Way, way back in perhaps 90 AD. Uh, he was taken through a door into the up dimension. The up dimension. Uh, we don't even have a name for it. Uh, length, uh, breadth, width, and height is what the Bible calls it. But it's a kind of a height that I've never been in before. And he was taken into that fourth dimension, time, where he saw and reported upon the events of the tribulation. Uh, the events of the judgment of God, the day of the Lord, and all the way into the far future in the New Jerusalem. He saw and recorded the day of the Lord. You know, that, that expression, day of the Lord, is used 25 times in Scripture. Beginning in Isaiah, ending in Second Peter, and John saw it. He recorded it. It, it, it. The day of the Lord, unimaginable catastrophe, is yet ahead of us time then was invented by God, was created by God for two purposes, redemption and judgment. And Jesus is the judge. You remember John 5.22, the Father hath given all judgment unto the Son, the Son of God. Certainly he's our Redeemer, but one day he's going to step forth as the mighty judge, and we know all about it. It, it, it is as good as already accomplished. So, John returns to write about what he saw while he was yet in the future. What did he see? A tribulation. He reported on it, just as did Enoch. Pretty amazing. The Bible. The Bible is built around time. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Of course, Christ is the center of all time space. And you know, I, I'll never forget the first time it ever occurred to me that the cross is the instrument of redemption not only for each individual but for the entire universe. Colossians 1, 19 and 20, for it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Christ, should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of His cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. 
So the cross was not just an instrument of earthly salvation. The cross was an instrument of redemption for the entire universe. And it's the reason God made the timeline. The end from the beginning with the cross in the middle was an instrument created by God for the purpose of redemption. Time has a purpose. It's not just time. <clears throat> it's not just tick tock, tick tock. It is not just this thing on my wrist. It is not just me walking from one place to another. Time has a purpose. The Bible is literally the book of time. And, and when you become conscious of this, uh, suddenly redemption takes on a whole new character. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. That's the middle of the Bible. Right smack in the, in the topographical center of the Bible is Psalm 117. And eight verses later is the middle verse in the Bible. The balancing point, if you will, in the Bible is right in that vicinity. And what does the balancing point say? It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Wow, that's the middle of the Bible. The whole Bible is balanced on that little idea. That's what time is. Time is not just, <clears throat> will he ever get here? Or will I be able to do this before the deadline? Which is, by the way, my life. Uh, and, a, and a cruel of deadlines. Time is something else. Time is a great instrument and we should see it as such. Psalm 118.8, the middle verse in the Bible, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. We read about times and seasons in the Bible. He changes the times and the seasons, he removeth kings, he setteth up kings, he giveth wisdom to the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. Acts 1.7, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He's, this is an acknowledgement here that the Father is the master of time, the creator of time, and that time is not just something that moves in little tiny increments of 10 to the minus 43 increments per second. It is not, and by the way, I, I don't believe that thing about 10 to the minus 43 increments per second. Because if God made time, it's perfect. And it operates on a principle that we don't even know about yet, which is, by the way, why uh, we can't travel in it. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Because, and I've got ahead of myself here, <clears throat> But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. That's an incredible verse in the Bible. That's exactly what I want written to me. Tell me about the times and seasons. There are people who spend their entire lives coming up with dates when the Lord's just got to come back by this date. And yet, the times and seasons, in some way we don't understand, operate according to God's rule in a, in a medium. It's called the temporal medium. And we don't even understand what it is. But God, I'm sure, smiles when he hears people like me talking about this and he says, wow, if you only knew what I'm, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm doing with time. You know, one of the good things about time is hope. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Notice the word now there. Right now. Think about that. We are the sons of God. By grace through faith. Through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. And so all of that 
banter between Tom and myself earlier today. You know, we don't even know what we're going to look like. We're going to be glorified. Why are we going to be glorified? Well, so we can glorify Him in the proper manner. But we glorify Him by honoring His Word. And that's why I like to read things like this. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is, not was or will be, but as He is, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So this is a purifying hope. And my reason for this message tonight is, is comfort, encouragement, and to build hope. To kind of give us an identity base. To tell us who we really are. And we need to know. And to constantly keep in mind who we really are. Hope is an amazing thing. The blessed hope, of course, is the catching away of the church, and we figure, and we watch, and we calculate, and we look, and still we can't guess when he's coming, nor will we ever be able to, but I know when he's coming. He's coming now, right now. Well, what is now? <laughs> Oops. And by the way, everybody's noticed that Israel's back in the land. What's Israel called? God's timepiece, right? Every, you've heard that a hundred times. The clock began to tick. Uh, some say in 1948 when Israel became a state. I say the clock was ticking for a long, long time. It became uh, very obvious that it was ticking back in 1897, First Zionist Congress, in, in which plans were made to, to bring the Jews back to the land. And then in 1947, the UN mandate, 1948, Israeli statehood. Uh, and then a series of things began to happen in succession, wars and changes of, of land and possessions. And 1967, the Six-Day War, 1973, the Yom Kippur War, and all these things ticking off little moments in the life of, of Israel. It's been 64 years now since Israel became a state. They're back in the land, headed toward their 70th birthday. Of course, as Jesus said, wars and rumors of wars, and you've heard it before, but World War I was, fight, it was fought to give the land to the Jews. World War II was fought to bring the Jews back into the land, and World War III is going to be fought. And by the way, we're all watching, aren't we? Yes. World War III is going to be fought to bring Israel to dominance. It's going to happen. Earthquakes in diverse places. I live in Oklahoma. <clears throat> in, in a really, really hot earthquake year, we'll have five or six. In, in, in the year 2011, we had 200 earthquakes in, in Oklahoma, in, including where I live. An earthquake was made the loudest sound I've ever heard in my entire life. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, go, Lord, go. <laughs> you know. Tsunamis, you know, uh, it's, earthquakes make tsunamis. And, and what's that phrase in the Bible? The sea and the waves roaring. Bizarre weather. What's the threat? <clears throat> well, uh, the Centers for Disease Control say that oddball weather patterns will cause famine because of crop failure and pestilence, propagation of disease. Jesus talked about all these things. Economic upheavals. <clears throat> what used to be called the European Common Market is now the Eurozone, and soon it's going to be, I don't know what, <laughs> broke. The International Monetary Fund is weakening. <clears throat> the head of the IMF recently said that the, uh, pro uh, the uh, prognosis for the IMF is grim indeed. Her name is Christine Lagarde. And she says that estimates of economic stability in Europe have been overestimated. <laughs> wow. 
Well, on and on it goes. Strange sights, UFOs increasing. You've heard about these the uh, events, uh, aerial trumpets and explosions people are hearing around the world. Uh, I wrote on that subject recently because it was covered so widely in the news. <clears throat> NASA is upset uh, because of coronal mass ejections. We're heading into a, a uh, an enhanced sunspot cycle right now, and these huge coronal mass ejections could shut down our power grids. Yes, they could. X-class flares. Remember a man by the name of Richard Carrington? There's an event named after him called the Carrington Event. <clears throat> In uh, <laughs> August 18th of 1859, uh, uh, Carrington was observing the sun and he saw a huge flash of light amazing flash of light and then just three or four days later what had started as an x-class solar flare swept across the earth and at that time the only power grids operating in 1859 were telegraph wires and that was such a powerful flare that it shut down the telegraph systems and in fact the the electrical power was so great <clears throat> that it burned up a lot of telegraph wire and a lot of telegraph signal stations. And people have said, and the scientists at NASA are now saying, you know, if that happened again, it could knock out power grids all over the world and they'd be down for months, if not years. And what does the Bible say about the sun in the last days? Yeah. It's going to go crazy. It's going to go dark, and then it's going to get brighter than usual, and then it's going to go dark. Well, NASA is already worried about that. I wonder if they're reading the Bible. <laughs> and then we have all this conversation. Underground military installations, where are they? What are they doing? <clears throat> is the space-time continuum being tampered with? Are there alien breeding programs? Uh, is quantum physics going to destroy the stability of our world? What about the God particle that we've heard about? Has that been discovered? That is the secret of why negatively and positively charged particles cling together in spite of uh, all of the uh, uh, all of the rules the contrary. And, and all of those differently charged particles are somehow brought together and held very tightly by this one particle which the scientists are looking for and they say that if they could find it they might eventually have the creative power of God. So they called the Higgs boson then the God particle. I know who the God particle is. He upholds all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3. His name is Jesus. And they're not going to find a God particle. What else does the God particle have to do with? It has to do with time, of course. And the the uh, particle accelerator at CERN has all to do with time and the experimentation of time. Oh, alien disclosure. Is it, a, is it on the horizon? Yes, it is, because the Bible talks about <clears throat> awful creatures that are going to be released upon the surface of the earth one day in the future. And boy, if they're not aliens, I don't know what they are. They come out of that bottomless pit and flood the entire world in the time of judgment. Right now, they're posing as uh, friendly aliens from outer space here to help us move to the next level of society. How about a spy drone? Want one flying over your backyard? <clears throat> How about hyperdimensional physics? I mean, the conversation today is, is bizarre. And have you noticed the Middle East? Of course you have. It all started when a man, uh, a protester of the, the Tunisian government, burned himself up in the street and a riot started. And the riot moved to Libya, Muammar Gaddafi is no more. It moved to Egypt, Mubarak is no more. Move, it's moved to Syria where it's uh, going to chase Bashar Assad out of office and the Muslim Brotherhood strikes again. Jordan, King Abdullah, worried. Iran, well, they're making all kinds of threats. The Russians have come. They are not just coming. They've moved their fleet now into the uh, uh, Mediterranean Sea. They have uh, railheads at the Gulf of Tartus in Syria, and they're arming the Middle East like crazy. 
Vladimir Putin, who likes to be seen riding a white horse with no shirt on, <clears throat> is right in the middle of everything. China. The Chinese, by the way, just recently sent intercontinental, or not intercontinental, but intermediate range ballistic missiles to the Saudi Arabians for a good price. And the Saudis say that they can fit nuclear warheads onto these. Boy, that's good news. <laughs> As of May 8, 2012, Israel formed a unity government. Benjamin Netanyahu formed a unity government. And that happened, if you recall, go back in your mind to May of 1967, just before the Six Day War. Israel formed a unity government at that time so that they could move quickly in the event of the need to strike or to defend themselves. And time continues to flow on. <clears throat> Let's talk about redemption. Time and redemption. We mentioned a minute ago that God created time for the purpose of executing redemption. And at the center of the timeline, and remember he created the end from the beginning, not the other way around, so that right in the middle our Lord could come <clears throat> and, and, and execute an incredible event called reconciliation. There in Colossians chapter 1, he reconciled everything, not only in earth, but in heaven too, by the power of his blood. <clears throat> Reconciliation uh, comes from a Greek word that means to change something from one thing into another thing entirely. I have been changed from one thing into another thing entirely. I've been changed from a sinner into one sanctified and one who will be glorified. I may not look it, but I have been, <laughs> I have been changed. I have been redeemed. I have been redeemed. And I wanted to place that on a, on a time base. How do you redeem time? Ephesians 5.15, <clears throat> see then that you walk circumspectly. Watch how you walk. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time. Time has redeemed you. Now you redeem the time. Time has redeemed you. You redeem the time. God made time so that you could be redeemed. Now you redeem the time while there is still time because there will be a time when there is no time. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I need to say that again. I, <laughs> redeeming the time because the days are evil. <laughs> Ephesians 5.17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise as understanding what the will of the Lord is. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, Colossians 4, 5. Redeeming the time. Now, put in this perspective, it means something different, doesn't it? Time redeemed you. Now you redeem time. Just makes perfect sense. So, suddenly you say to yourself, wow, all of that time, I didn't know what to do with my time. Well, you, you redeem the time. I'm not going to tell you how to redeem time. That's my next book, 150 Ways to Redeem Time. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <clears throat> but, you know, perilous times are coming, too. They are. And here time is a significator. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, says Paul writing to Timothy. We're in the last days. Those per perilous times have come. There's a Greek word, chalepas, uh, that is translated perilous. And you know, the only other place in the Bible that that, the New Testament that that Greek word is used is to describe the demoniac that came roaring out to meet Christ when they crossed the Sea of Galilee and went over to the west, to the eastern side of the, of the sea. And this madman came out, and he was called exceedingly fierce. That's the exact same word used to translate perilous times. In other words, insane times. Times that where sense just goes out the window. Have you ever had the feeling lately that common sense, that 
that just common analysis and reaction has just gone out the window and you think you're the only sane person around. <laughs> oh my. Well, perilous times shall come and then Paul, you know, goes to, through this long list of personal defective behaviors. But at the end of that passage, he says, now, as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so also, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. And, and these two guys, Jannes and Jambres, were the guys that contested with Moses, you know, they were able to, to work miracles, uh, uh, counterfeiting God's miracle power, indicating in Paul's words that that same thing is going to happen again in the last days, perilous times shall come, and there will be people working false wonders by demonic power. Get ready for it. And, and a lot of the people who will be speaking uh, at this uh, summit are, are going to be telling you how that's happening today already. I said a moment ago that the reason I'm here tonight is to encourage, to comfort, and I really want you to be comforted. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I love those words but to obtain salvation. Now, you might say, wait a minute, I'm already saved. No, not yet. You haven't been taken up and given your glorified body. You haven't had your exit interview with Christ yet. I'm waiting to obtain salvation. I really want to obtain salvation. You know, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. In fact, if you've read any of my writing, I believe in the pre-pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I think it's going to take place quite a while before the tribulation. And the, the idea of the rapture is an idea that I love because it is my resurrection day as it will be your resurrection day. That's when we're all going to be resurrected. Amazingly, God has chosen one day to resurrect the whole body of Christ all at the same time. Would you have done it that way? That sounds like a, a, a logistical nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but he's going to do it. He's going to resurrect the living and the dead in the body of Christ in one moment in the twinkling of an eye at a moment that he has designated. Nobody knows what it is yet. Why did he designate a moment like that when all the church would be resurrected? And I'm going to let you go home and think about that one yourself because I don't know. If I had been God, I would have said, I think I'm going to resurrect people one at a time as they die and, and let them kind of drift on up to heaven and not put them to work up there. No, no. He's doing something incredibly dramatic he has built this timeline and he has put markers along it. And for me, the big marker is that resurrection day to obtain salvation. He died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. Time is the enemy. Time is the enemy. How is time the enemy? We quoted a physicist early, earlier who was talking about the arrow of time that only goes in the direction of disorder and chaos. Another physicist, C.P. Snow, described the process of disorder. The three laws of thermodynamics. The first law is you can't win. There's the secular view. You can't win because you can't get something for nothing because matter and energy are conserved. This is the law of conservation of energy. And, and so no matter how long you play the game, it's all going to come out the same. 
And then the second law, you can't break even because you can't return to the same energy state. Since the arrow of time is flying toward disorder, energy is running down. Uh, wow. And there's always an increase in disorder. Entropy increases. You can't even break even. And, by the way, you can't get out of the game. <laughs> Why? Because absolute zero is unattainable. The, the Earth will freeze in the dark at some point, billions of years from now. And that's where it'll end. Freezing in the dark. And you, with, all the, with all these dead bodies on it. And now, isn't that a marvelous view? Well, Jesus has defeated entropy. You can win. <laughs> Amen. You can win. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the creator of energy and matter. By the way, you can break even. In him, disorder has become order. And what can you do? You can redeem the time. Wow. Redeem the time. And you know, I am utterly convinced that we should redeem the time. I am convinced that I should redeem the time. Time redeemed me. And it'd be good for me to return the favor. <laughs> and number three, you can get out of the game because you'll be resurrected into a glorified body like his, new heavens and a new earth, and you're going to be a part of the whole operation. I have not seen, neither have ear heard. Wow, I'm telling you what, it's going to be fantastic. Jesus is the master of time. <clears throat> Hebrews 1.3, speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had, sat, had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, that act of purging our sins is an act that he performed on the timeline. He is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's holding everything together. He is the God particle. He's holding it all together. And so time is a transaction between the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit. And time was created for redemption, for judgment, for setting things right. Hebrews 1.10, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they shall wax old, as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same and thy years shall not fail. You get that? Here the writer to the Hebrews is saying, when it's all done and the Lord is through with the timeline, he's gonna say, wow, man, shake the dust off that thing. And he's gonna fold it up just like you would fold up a garment. And a new timeline will be created, a new heavens and a new earth. And this one, without sin, I am convinced. One hardly dares imagine such a thing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, said Jesus, reading from Isaiah, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable gear of the Lord. And he closed the book. He read Isaiah with complete understanding of the timeline. He closed the book and gave it again to the minister, sat down, and the eyes of them uh, that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, what Isaiah had written was something 
quite similar up to a point. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that's where Jesus stopped reading because that's where the timeline stopped and the day of the vengeance of our God, which is still future. And so Jesus was so perceptive of time that he knew where to stop reading in Isaiah. <laughs> you know, a letter from a viewer. And by the way, I may not be that perceptive in time. I may be running over my time. <coughs> I, I was going to share a letter that I got from a viewer about hopelessness. And the letter said, We study the Word. We study, we read books. We look at signs and we're all, we have all become so tired in watchful waiting that we simply can't stand it anymore. And I understand that feeling because when I pray concerning my own congregation, I always say, Lord, you've got a bunch of people about to turn blue down here. <laughs> We're holding our breath. We see that the time has come. Oops, what did I say? The time has come. I, clearly, I don't understand that much about time. And you know, my time is finished. <laughs> And let's talk about what a lot of people are saying. It's about time. You know, uh, people are very, very eager, I would say. They're saying, you know, it, it's about time for the Lord to come. And yet, prophecy is one of the most controversial subjects in the world today. The imminent return of our Lord Jesus Christ is hotly debated and actually believed by only a small fraction of Christians worldwide, which I find amazing. We're going to be talking about the any moment return of Christ, and when you talk about any moment, you're talking about a moment in time. <clears throat> and time uh, was the subject of this book that to uh, Tom mentioned a minute ago. I started thinking about time, as many other people have thought about time, and I discovered that the Bible is literally the book of time. Today there are huge uh, doctrinal differences in eschatology. Uh, most would doubt that Jesus Christ is coming back at all, or if, if he's coming back maybe in some spiritual form, but certainly he's not coming back as literally described in the Bible. That's just for sort of immature people who want to believe that. Uh, Maybe he'll come in a time of war. Maybe he'll come in a time of peace. Maybe he'll come to set up the millennium. Maybe there's no millennium at all. You've heard all the arguments. Maybe there's no tribulation. Maybe there is a tribulation.
Gary Sturman is the host of Prophecy in the News, web and TV broadcast. He is the ministry's primary contributor today. Since uh, 1989, he has written articles and co-authored books. Let me get this up here for my blind eyes. Co-authored books in affiliation with the late J.R. Church, founder of Prophecy in the News. Gary is also editor of the ministry magazine. This important ministry originates television, audio, video, print productions, dedication, uh, dedicated to the exposition of Bible prophecy to a global audience. Gary believes that the prophetic exegesis of God's Word is one of the most effective ways of convicting the contemporary mind of the need for the redemption that is offered only through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Since 1983, Gary has also pastored Grace Fellowship Church in Oklahoma City, a community devoted to in-depth linguistic, historical, and contextual Bible study from the premillennial, pre-tribulational, and dispensational perspective. Gary recently authored the best-selling book, Time Travelers of the... <clears throat> Maybe it's three and a half years long. Maybe it's seven years long. You've heard all the arguments. Take your choice. But... I'm not going to be talking about the points of argumentation this evening. I'm here to encourage you all. And I hope that when I'm finished, you'll, your heart will be lightened just a little bit by what God has done. You've heard this phrase, Jesus is coming soon. Have you not? I mean, preachers ever since 1970 and before have been uh, ending their messages by saying Jesus is coming soon. Now why did they say that? Well, everything's in place prophetically. The stage is set. But there are others who say, well, you can't say <clears throat> soon. Maybe not so far away, but certainly not soon. And then somebody else will say soon. Well, when? Well, I think next year. Okay, great. And, and we've all been here, right, for the last 40 years. <laughs> it, this year for sure. <clears throat> oh, yeah. And, and that can get kind of frustrating. So that's why I want to talk about time today. I really want to talk about time because everybody talks about time. <clears throat> There's an old saying that, that is humorous. And it is that uh, time was created by God to keep everything from happening at once. And it really kind of sounds funny, but you know what? It's the truth. He invented time. Bible, how Hebrew prophets shattered the barriers of time space. And uh, let me add to this that Gary is absolutely, no, all joking aside, one of my favorite and has been for a very long time, for a long time, one of my favorite uh, writers on the subject of end time prophecy and as a matter of fact I would be happy to plagiarize his material and report it to be my own <laughs> if there wasn't already so many other people doing that for me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Gary Stearman of Prophecy in the News. <clears throat> uh, thank you Tom. Wow, what can I say? Tonight, we're going to be talking about time and space and God and Bible prophecy, four of my favorite subjects. And these are subjects that secular men and sacred men down through the ages have talked about and come to no particular conclusions. However, <clears throat> conclusions are possible. And before I begin, I'd like to open in prayer, and let's just commit our time to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for this gathering tonight. We ask that uh, the words spoken here, the thoughts expressed from your word, will be fitting and proper and appropriate, and that we will be edified by them. And we pray this through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Out of nothing, I believe, he just brought time into being. And there's a reason why he did it. Will Rogers said half our life is spent trying to find something to do with the time we've rushed through life trying to save. Well, <laughs> yeah. And then that famous agnostic playwright, Eugene O'Neill, there is no present, there's no or future, only the past happening over and over again now. 
And Solomon sort of agreed with Eugene O'Neill. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and the thing which shall be done. There's no new thing under the sun. And Solomon was right. And yet Solomon was guessing. He didn't really know much. Nothing keeps, one philosopher said. There's one law in the universe, and that is the law of now. <clears throat> Now, hmm, what's now? The Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, time is a created thing. To say, I don't have the time, is to say, I don't want to. <laughs> eh, interesting, we could talk about that for a long time if we had the time. <laughs> a physicist by the name of Sean Carroll said, the asym asymmetry of time, the arrow that points from past to future plays an unmistakable role in our everyday lives. It accounts for why we cannot turn an omelet into an